Hello everybody, my name is Bruce McKenzie and I'm here today to talk to you about IFRIC 23. Now a bit of background to IFRIC 23. IFRIC 23 is an interpretation of ICE 12 that was issued by the IFRIC last year. Now the first thing I always like to ask people is, are IFRIC interpretations mandatory? Now you'd be surprised how many people still think that IFRIC interpretations are guidance or something you can just look at when you want to. But they are actually part of the IFRS framework, which means IFRICs have the same standing as an IFRS standard. So in other words, you have to apply these. Now, let's take a little look at IS-12 and see what it said. To start off with, remember, IS-12 is a standard that deals with income taxes. So it includes everything effectively that's either a tax or, of course, deferred taxes. It excludes things like government grants, remember, that are covered by IS-20. Now, what's key to remember about your IS-12 is that it determines current tax and says you need to obviously disclose the current tax you're paying and the deferred tax you're paying, but it doesn't tell you how to calculate those. Remember, IFRS is written for a global audience. And the key thing about the global audience is that every country has its own tax legislation. So whether you're in Colombia or whether you're in South Africa or the UK or wherever you may be, you apply the tax rules in that specific country. Once you've determined that the tax payable in that specific country, then of course you would take that and you would disclose it under IS-12. Now, deferred tax is a little bit different because deferred tax does give you a calculation. Remember that key calculation that says effectively I have to take the carrying amount of an asset, deduct from it its tax base to get a temporary difference. And obviously with the temporary difference, we then multiply that by either the usage or the capital gains rate to give us our deferred tax. Now in that calculation, of course, things like the tax base and what the tax rates are, are once again determined by your local tax law. But the rest of it is determined under IS-12. So of course, once you've got your deferred tax and your current tax, you disclose those, put them into the balance sheet or the income statement or equity, depending where it is, and that effectively is IS-12. So what did IFRIC 23 come along and say? IFRIC 23, in essence, is dealing with uncertain tax positions. Now, what I mean by an uncertain tax position? We know we're in a situation in many places in the world where people take what I call aggressive tax positions. Now, remember, it's very important. We're not talking about tax evasion. We're talking about tax avoidance. Remember, tax evasion is illegal. That's the one that says effectively, I've earned money and I'm not going to pay tax. I'm going to hide it. That's evasion. Nobody's dealing with that here. We're dealing here with tax avoidance schemes, which are legal. Remember, this is a situation where a company may take the tax law as it is and either interpret it differently or try and apply it differently to minimize their tax payable. Now, this is very common. The problem with it is it's become very topical in the press. Think about it. We've seen the Panama Papers, the Paradise Papers. We're seeing companies like Google, companies like Amazon, all being criticized in the press at the moment around the fact that they are hiding their taxes. Or so not hiding, minimizing their taxes. Now, it's not that what they're doing is wrong, but many people in the world are feeling that this isn't quite what companies should be doing. Many of you would have seen recently there's been a paper issued on ethical tax practices, which is saying companies should ethically pay tax in full in the countries in which they earn it. Now, do I think companies are going to stop tax structuring? No. In fact, if any of you are working or have worked in, in, in investment banking, you'll know that, of course, in investment banking, this is a big thing. Tax-based structuring is very, very important because it creates a lot of benefit for companies and their shareholders. So as much as the companies are saying, well, we're seeing this as something we should be doing to minimize our tax payable, to benefit the, benef uh, the benefit the shareholders, the other side, of course, is that governments don't see it positively and the press like to get hold of this. Now, it's important for you to think about that because it's important for you to keep in mind that there is some criticism at the moment around tax structuring. Now, how does that tie in with what we're looking at today? There are various taxes companies pay. It could be a capital gains, normal taxes, transfer duties, VAT, whatever it may be. Any tax that falls within IS-12 is subject to this interpretation. Now, what exactly did the IFRIC look at? There's a number of things that we looked at to start off with. Firstly, what is our unit of account? So what are we looking at individual or group uh, taxes? Secondly, what are the uh, assumptions you would use that when the tax authority is taking a look at those, or in other words, examining the, uh, the tax structure you're looking at. Thirdly, how do you determine the tax amount? And lastly, what if there's any change in facts and circumstances? Let's take a look at each of these four in detail. The first one deals effectively with our unit of account. Are we dealing with things collectively or individually? So a simple example, 
I've got five tax, tax issues that are being queried by the tax authorities. In my specific jurisdiction, would they look at each of those individually or would they look at them collectively? Now, that, of course, is something that the IFRI can't determine on because each country would need to take a look at what's applicable there. But you would need to ask yourselves, in my tax jurisdiction, would the tax authorities look at these collectively or individually? If it's individually, then you would apply the principles in IFRIC 23 to each one individually. Whereas, of course, if it's a group and they'd look at everything together, then you would apply it together. Now, some people out there may be thinking, well, are we going to get the same answer? And the answer is no, you're not. Because whether you apply this individually, and you'll see as we work through this course today, or whether you look at them collectively, you could end up with a different answer based on probabilities, etc., that we're going to take a look at later. Also, remember, there are other reasons that you could get a difference. Maybe one group of, uh, of, of queries is just dealing with your normal tax, whereas other tax queries are dealing with CGT or capital gains. So you need to be looking at those and saying, can we offset the two? Can we not? Once again, as I said at the beginning of the presentation, all of this depends very heavily on the tax jurisdiction in which you're working. Now, this, of course, is judgmental, but you'll need to the first thing you need to assess. Am I dealing with individual ones or am I dealing with a collective one? The second one says you need to make assumptions. Now, this is very, very uh, contentious at the moment, because what we're saying is we're saying you need to assume that the tax authorities would investigate any of the tax positions you've got and that they would have full knowledge of all the relevant facts and circumstances. That's quite heavy. Think about it. We're saying effectively, you have to assume that they would investigate you and you have to assume that they would have full knowledge of everything around that structure that you've entered into. And with that in mind, you then need to make a judgment and you need to say, is it probable that the tax authority would accept that tax position? I'm going to stop there for a second because I think it's important that you understand that I think this is going to end up being one of the most key judgments that directors are going to make in the accounts. If you are in a company or if you're the auditor of a company where there are very aggressive tax positions, we're saying that every year you're going to need to sit and say, with the tax authority having all that knowledge, is it probable that they're going to allow us to, to keep that or are they going to challenge it? Remember, probability is a 50% rating. So we're saying, is it 51% probable that I'm going to get away with it or 49%? The problem with this is that everything I'm about to talk to now around measurement depends on this probability. It's a key judgment. And you'll see later there's some disclosures required around that. The other problem, of course, is that if you're a director of a company, you're signing off on this because it's going to be part of your accounts. So there could be a bit of a risk to you. In addition, the auditors are going to have to audit and sign off that they've agreed with that probability. What does this mean? I think the reality is for most of you, you're going to end up consulting with tax experts. Probably going to cost you money. So I think it's good news for those of you out there who could be tax consultants. Of course, on the other side, it could potentially require, once again, the use of experts, additional cost, a burden on everybody. But this is going to be one of the key assumptions that you have to determine. Why is it so important? The reason being, it impacts the measurement. If your assessment is that it is probable that you're going to get away with it. So what I mean is we've looked at our tax position. We believe it's probable that the tax authorities would accept that. Then you would report your tax in your accounts as if you always have. So the same way you've always done it. Assuming it's probable, effectively report it as you would. The problem with this is what happens if you determine it's not probable? So I've done my assessment and I've said on the basis that the tax authorities have got all the facts and circumstances that we know and they've done this assessment, we believe it is not probable that they would accept that treatment. If that's the case, you need to adjust your tax expense. That's the interesting bit. And now you can see why that probable, not probable becomes so important. Now, what I mean by adjust? What they're saying effectively is you would need to take that tax position and using either the most likely amount or the expected value approach, remember those are the same approaches used in almost all the new standards, you would need to determine what is the amount at which I must adjust my tax expense. Now, of course, those two approaches are, are very common across IFRS. So, for example, the most likely amount, if I've got something like a binary option that says I'm either going to pay X amount or not pay X amount, I can use that. Or, of course, there's the expected value approach. 
Remember the expected value approach saying on a basis of probabilities, what effectively do I think I'll get away with? And, and taking that basis of probabilities, multiplying by the, by the amounts that you expect to pay and ending up with an expected value. I think you can see that this is where a lot of you are going to be saying, but that means we're going to be highlighting this problem to our revenue authorities. And the answer is, yes, you are. This is where some of the criticisms of this, this interpretation have come in. And the fact that you are going to be putting this in and saying, well, hang on, we're putting a big spotlight or a big red flag in our accounts, telling the tax authorities that we don't think it's probable that we're going to get away with it and that we should adjust for it. Well, the answer is yes, you are. Now, as much as some people criticize it, I want you to think about something. Everywhere in IFRS that we have to do some sort of assessment like we're doing here, we adjust. Pensions, provisions, revenue, everywhere, financial instruments. All of these standards require you that when there's some level of uncertainty, you need to do an adjustment. So why not taxes? And the answer is, we should be doing it for tax. We do it for every other balance in the accounts. We should clearly be doing it here as well. So the reality is, this is why we've issued FRIC 23. It's making things consistent with the way we treat uncertainties everywhere else. A couple of things about that to point out. Remember, it doesn't just impact your current tax. It could also impact your deferred tax. Remember, of course, we're dealing with both current and deferred, and you need to be consistent. So if you've made an adjustment to the current tax, potentially that could impact on the deferred tax because your tax base could change. So just remember all of these things do need to be adjusted for. Now, let's stop there. The first three things that the EFRIC looked at, to recap. Firstly, what is your unit of account? Are you dealing with them collectively or are you dealing with them individually? Secondly, with the assumption that the revenue authorities will investigate you with full knowledge of everything that, that, that they could have, then the question would be effectively, do I think it is probable that they would accept my tax position. Third one, if you think it is probable, report the tax position as you would normally have recorded it or as you have recorded it. But if you determine it's not probable, then you need to adjust. And you adjust your tax expense in your accounts based on the best method applicable, depending of course on what type of tax you're looking at, and you would effectively adjust in the accounts and make that disclosure. That's the first three things we looked at. The last one, what if there are changes in facts and circumstances? Now, things could change. Remember, you could have a change in they, the, the tax authorities could come out with a ruling. There could be a, a ruling on another company that makes you be able to see what they would do with yours. There could be expiry. Maybe they could only investigate you for five years and that five years is not expired. There are various things that could give rise to changes effectively in, in, in your assessment. Every year you would need to look at that change in assessment and say, has my number, or the probable number that I looked at, changed? And this, as I said, is an ongoing thing until the tax expires. Now, remember, of course, the one thing they have said is a change in facts and circumstances is not just the passing of time. So assuming that the tax authorities have got five years to investigate, you cannot say, well, moving from year two to year three to year four, that's a change in circumstance. We're saying, remember, providing they have the ability to do an investigation in every year, that wouldn't be a change in fact and circumstance. You need something else to point at. Now, if you have done any assessment and there is a change, how do you account for it? Well, FRIC 23 just simply says you look at IS-8. Remember, IS-8 looks at your changes in accounting policies, estimates, and errors. So what would this be? Let me give you a second to think about it. If I, in any year, looked at the tax position from last year and I amended it this year for a change in facts and circumstances, how would I account for it? I'm hoping you all realize this is a change in accounting estimate. Remember, it's not a change in policy because we've always recognized our tax. And it's not an error because if we made the assessment last year with all the right facts and circumstances, it's not an error. So we do as a change in estimate. And remember, changes in estimates are all prospective. So you make the adjustment to only in the current year. The other one to point out is what about post balance sheet events? So what if something happens between the year end and the date we sign off the accounts? Would you need to worry about those? And the standard, once again, points to another one and says you need to consider the fact the, 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 all the, the, the details in IS-10. And IS-10 says, remember, you look at either adjusting events or non-adjusting events. Adjusting events, those that you would adjust for, remember, those effectively where something's been given to you post your end that gives evidence of a fact or circumstances that, that happened before your end. 
and of course your non-adjusting events if it's something that happened after year end. So those effectively are the four things that the EFIC looked at. What is your unit of account? Do we think it's probable that, we'll, 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 that they'll accept our position? How do we determine it? What is our measurement? And lastly, of course, what if there are changes in facts and circumstances? Now, those all impact on the measurement. Last thing I want to touch on, what do you need to disclose? Well, EFRIC 23 itself doesn't give you any requirements for disclosure. All it does is it refers to other parts of IFRS where it says that you need to give disclosures. And the first one it points to is ICE 1. Remember, ICE 1 says you're required to disclose any judgments that you've made. I spoke earlier about the judgment you make about the probability. That's quite a big judgment. If this could materially impact on your accounts, you need to disclose that as a key judgment. Second one, of course, ICE 1 also says, remember that you need to disclose effectively numbers. So what are the assumptions you've made? Where have you had key estimates? What if those change? All of that information needs to be given, especially if this is material to you. So ICE 1, there's a lot of disclosure that you would need to give around this. And I think the one thing I will point out is I think a lot of people don't give enough disclosure generally around judgments. Where this is material, I would encourage the auditors and the preparers in the room to take a look at it and say we need to spend more time looking at these. The last one to point out in the disclosure is, well, what if I've assumed that it is probable? So I do my assessment of my tax position and I say, I think it's probable that I get away with it. Does that mean if 23 doesn't apply to me? Well, not really. Because the last thing it points out is, says, remember, you still need to consider ICE 37 on provisions. And ICE 37 says, where you have a contingent liability, you need to make disclosures around that. Remember, contingent liabilities have got a much lower threshold. Obviously, if you've got a full liability, you recognize it. Where there's uncertainty, we could potentially recognize provisions. But where it's even more uncertain, you've got this contingent liability disclosure. You need to consider whether you have to give that disclosure under IS 37. So please bear that in mind. So when does this become effective for you? Well, this one becomes effective 1 January 2019. So you've got about a year or so before this becomes effective. But remember, this is going to be effectively retrospective. Now, why do I say effectively? Because when you're in 2019, you still got to consider any outstanding tax positions. So your 2018, 2017, 2016, if those could still be challenged by your tax authorities, you'd need to take the cumulative effect of all of those uncertainties and adjust for them. Which means even if you had very aggressive positions now that you wanted to unwind, you would still need to make disclosure of those. As I said, I think this is going to create a very big challenge for those of you who are heavily involved effectively in tax planning. So folks, effectively that is IFRIC 23. Um, I hope you got some value out of it. I hope you, uh, when you get into the application of it, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of questions. I'm sure there are going to be a lot of challenges around it. Um, but bear in mind, of course, this is something that's been issued by the IFRIC. It is mandatory. And uh, my suggestion to you out there is for those of you in companies, I would strongly suggest if you do do tax structuring, you put this on the audit committee and the board's agendas. I think they should be considering it. Uh, for those of you, the auditors in the room, same thing. I think you should make your clients aware of it. Make them aware that this is something that could, of course, create negative publicity. I always say it's a test of the newspapers. You don't want to be the guy on the front page of the newspaper where people are talking about the fact that you haven't been paying your taxes. Folks, that's it from me. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the, uh, the rest of your session today and uh, hope I can see you soon. Take care.